panel discussion. Okay, friends. But before that, give yourselves a round of applause. Yes, sir. Yeah, wonderful. This new panel, really wonderful. Okay, and then some technical matters. If you have family in Chicago, they can visit you after sessions, like when there's nothing going on in the evening. Let's say if your family in Chicago, they can come. Uh, if, let's say the movie is over, they can bring you to dinner. But no session should be disrupted. And Dr. Sue Russell has to know, okay? And uh, the time during which you will be with your host families, you are your host family's children. No one else can. <laughs> Not even your uh, Filipino family. Okay? So, just remember those things. Let Dr. Sue know. We're now starting our afternoon panel discussion. Uh, Monday, you had Dr. Kendall, right? It was great. In the morning and afternoon, you had Dr. Mitch, who also liked it very much. And, oh, I missed this morning, so I should have, but I read Dr. Sue's PowerPoint in advance, and it was just really wonderful. Uh, full of facts and figures, and you did your workshop identifying the community needs. So now we will learn from each other. Principally, we have a lot of people who are doing environmental uh, things at NIU and in the community. And we have with us today here uh, three persons doing uh, different groups. First, I'd like to introduce you uh, to Sarah Worski. She's the president. I'm sorry if I read your last name. Okay, Green Post Environmental Alliance. And she also works at NIU. You might visit her office. Yes, you will visit her office too. So she's got uh, two hats, the, the non-governmental, non-for-profit student organization and a professional hat. Well, I forgot, a third hat, she's studying at NIU too, okay? And then we have my friend, and Dr. Sun's friend too, Eric Sterling. He will tell about everything he does. Uh, uh, very active from water to bicycle to name it. <laughs> and oh, I see this person grow up from this teeny little boy now. He's taller than I am. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, Alex Riley, he's with the Sycamore High School. So we will listen to the three of them share their uh, knowledge about environmentalism. So first, maybe I'll ask the three of them, whoever wants to go ahead first, introduce yourself first, in general, who you are. There's a microphone in there. Um, hi, I'm Alex Riley. I'm a junior at Sycamore High School, and for the environment, I'm a member of our high school's environmental studies club, and I lobby for the Sierra Club. campus, no environmental activism groups 
I decided to form one, and uh, it's entitled the Green Plaza Environmental Alliance that uh, Sarah is now president of. Uh, we've been very active on campus trying to get bike lanes installed. Uh, we had an initiative to uh, to follow, or actually to the procurement office here at NIU, try to get them to follow their supply chain to not support the war in the Congo, to, uh, to have a conflict-free initiative here at NIU, and also our latest initiative is to ban the bottle. It's an initiative that's been, uh, been put through at the University of Vermont to ban water bottle sales and vending machines, and uh, so they've kind of set the precedent that we're trying to use that template to, uh, to push that through here at NIU, which is a very difficult thing because it's a state school and there's a lot of uh, committees involved and where the money goes and things like that. So it's kind of like uh, beating your head up against the wall to use an American metaphor, so to speak, but uh, it doesn't stop us from trying and uh, and that's why we're here today, because we, we really want to change things at NIU. Not that we don't think that NIU is a great school, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, there's so many causes, so many problems in the world. Why on earth did you focus on the environment? Why not just Congo? Why not just conflict? Why not just one specific issue, why, why environment? Like, could you inspire our students to also take up environmentalism as a cause? Why not women's issues and so on? Well, I think like you mentioned, the environment is such a broad issue and it is connected to women's issue. I actually took a course titled Gender in the Environment and it explored how close gender and sexuality was related to environmental issues such as you know, all around the world it's mostly women who are responsible for getting the water and you know, taking care of the family. Um, but within the context of environmentalism you can you know, be broad and just fight for the whole idea of environmentalism or you can focus on a specific issue such as water and even within water you can focus on you know agricultural runoff and water rights such as Eric does or you can focus on you know um, privatization of water there's just such a broad aspect to environmentalism and it's really important because we inherited this environment from those before us and we're going to leave it to those after us and wouldn't you want your grandchildren to have the same environment that you had and the same opportunities to be able to see the same mountains, rivers, national parks and access those same you know, birds and animals and be able to subside off those and you know, just really live and enjoy our earth. And that's why I think the environment is mostly important and that's why I got into it because I just want to leave this place better than what I found it. Studying anthropology here at NIU, we get a lot of influences from uh, theorists. And uh, one of the people that we study, through Dr. Thu, actually, is uh, Gregory Bateson. And uh, he teaches, that, teaches us that everything is interrelated and interconnected. And the environment is, I couldn't think of anything that's more interconnected for people around the, around the world. And, one thing relates to another. So if, if we if we had a clean environment, we would probably have uh, less cancer in the world. Uh, there's so many different things that, that, that can connect to it. So uh, I, I truly believe that the environment uh, is is one of those things that can we can all find common ground on. I started environmentalism just because I really like to be outside. Um, and I sort of, I started seeing, you know, what people were doing to, um, like, rivers and forests, just completely getting rid of them. And I was thinking, well, this isn't fair, you know. Um, we're one species on this whole planet, and it seems really unfair for us to just completely deface everything else. 
I mean, we're sort of looking at it like it's us and nature, but really, we're part of nature and we're part of the world. So um, I just, I want to sort of try to help give a voice to, you know, everything that we're just messing with. <laughs> I'd like to comment on that. To, to segue off that thought, uh, I recently watched a movie. I actually couldn't sit through it. I started to watch it. It was called Earthlings. And it was about all the abuse that happens to animals on factory farms and things like that. And just this idea of us as a species, as earthlings, but we don't think of animals as like earthlings. They're not earthlings. They're, they're animals, and, and so to speak, that we aren't animals, but we really are animals. We're mammals as well. And we can find a lot of uh, interconnectedness, like Bateson had said, about how they breastfeed their babies and things like that, that we can find common ground there um, is the fact that we can treat our water better, our animals better, ourselves better, and their environment better. Uh, you met, uh, I think, at least Sarah and uh, Eric mentioned water. What's wrong with water? Water is life. <laughs> Everyone knows that our bodies are made up of what, 70 something percent of water. Um, and I mean, water is, you know, both, it can be both a local, like, regional, and like global cycle. And you know, we hear every day about, you know, people having issues with access to clean water. Um, not only clean water, but fresh water, available water. We use water for everything. We use it, you know, to clean ourselves, to drink, for agriculture. Um, and you know we're using up a lot of our fresh water, and you know, that's a huge issue. Which is you know one of the reasons we're doing the ban the bottle or H two O to go here on campus is to expose some of those issues. They're both economic, environmental, and health issues with using water bottles. It takes like 20 times more water to use that bottle or to make that plastic bottle and to transport that bottle they're basically selling you, uh, you know, the same tap water back at 2,000 times the price. So that's one of the reasons why we focus on that issue here on campus. And, you know, I just went hiking at Stark Rock two days ago, and I saw like 20 plastic water bottles in a canyon where, you know, people can't access that because it's like, you know, 50 feet down, but, you know, they throw their water, water bottle there, and, you know, that's just going to go right to the river. It's going to and we look at the ocean and there's that giant plastic island floating around. I just watched the documentary Plastic Planet not too long ago and shows how all these little pieces of plastic are in inside fish. They're mistaking these pieces of plastic for plankton. So you know, water is connected to other environmental issues as well. And you know, there's so many awesome documentaries out there such as Blue Gold and Water Wars, which really expose, um, you know, all the issues surrounding water, water privatization, water cleanliness. Um, when I talk about water privatization, um, you know, water was historically a public good, you know, it's what we call a common resource. Everyone should have equal access to it, equal access to clean and affordable water. Now water is being privatized. There's private companies buying this water, water rights, and selling it back to you when it should be controlled by the government, regulated by the government more harshly. Um, you know, we need to ration our water. We see these wars over, you know, oil and such right now, but, you know, the underlying factor behind all that is also water, because not only rights to waterways, but access to clean water to run these operations. I think water is really connected to the energy sector as well, especially in the United States. Fracking is a huge issue now, and that uses a lot of water and includes a lot of water. So, I'm not sure what um, you're getting at about water. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting at the uh, what Eric mentioned, and we also discussed at the cafe the banning the bottled water at NIU. So, to what extent? If you can rate it from zero to ten, is it uh, a doable goal that we can achieve at NIU? And 
from zero to 10, how far is the campaign of the different organizations at NIU to ban the bumper water? I know there are steps uh, being yeah. taken here. Yeah. There are definitely steps because in order to ban plastic water bottles, we first need to provide an alternative. Um, one of our goals is to get the university to apply, supply incoming students with the reusable water bottles, which I see you guys all have some sports bottles there. And <laughs> there are groups on campus giving out these water bottles at the beginning of last year as well. So that's a start. But we also need um, water bottle filling stations or places to get clean filtered water on campus. Um, in, this so, building, is there in this building there's one in the basement um, but you know there's not one anywhere up here. You know we have the say so. Is that where the computer lab is? Yeah in the computer lab in the basement by the non-traditional commuter student lounge um, there's a hydration station there. There's one in every residence hall. There's also one in the recreation center so that's a start that they're in all the, the living buildings or buildings that are lived in on campus. However, you know, we would like to see one in every um, in every building. Eric mentioned the University of Vermont being the only public school that successfully has banned bottled water on campus. Um, they have, I believe, 70 something water bottle refill stations throughout their campus. And that ban was just announced in January of this year and they're facing a lot of um, negative feedback from the corporations. I don't remember if it was um, Pepsi or Coca-Cola because they are the ones who own designing Aquafina, but they're basically saying that, you know, you're bad mouthing our brand by banning this bottle of water. And so that's one of the issues that we're going to face. NIU has a contract with Pepsi to sell designing water on campus. So how will our work affect that agreement between like those two as a business? You know, will we be reprimanded saying, hey, we're gonna lose this company money? Um, also, you know, we have negative feedback from a few students who say, I don't like how the water tastes on campus, or you know, it's so convenient to just get a bottle of water. So another goal of our H2O to go campaign is to educate people to say, hey, actually, they don't taste different if you just, you know, taste them. We've done a few blind taste tests and we found about 60 people, 60% 60 of people actually prefer the water from the hydration station. And there's about 70% of people that couldn't even tell the difference in um, related or rated or Dizani, Aquafina. Aquafina, yeah, that's. Rated Aquafina, which is what we saw on campus, as their least favorite. So, you know, in a blind study, they actually don't like the bottled water. And so it's part of educating them, you know, on that, and also the regulations about bottled water. The fact that bottled water is not regulated as harshly as tap water. You can get online right now and see exactly what um, kind of chemical concentrations are in the water that you're drinking from this faucet. Whereas you can't obtain any reports like that from a major bottle water company. Water bottle company. Um, the EPA actually does not regulate bottled water at all. It's left up to the FDA in the United States. And if that bottled water doesn't cross state lines, actually no one regulates that. So that's a huge issue. And another documentary uh, uh, called Tapped. It exposes a lot of these issues and shows how one guy actually took a bottle of water straight off the shelf and found traces of toluene, um, which is, you know, in gasoline and is um, a known carcinogen. You know, it's not as safe as you think. Am I saying all bottled water has harmful chemicals? No, maybe not. But in the end, you're paying 2,000 times more for bottled water and you can't guarantee how safe it is. And it's made of plastic, which is a non-renewable uh, resource from petroleum. So there's just so many ups to drinking tap water as opposed to drinking bottled water. As long as we educate students about that and push the university to provide more alternatives, I believe, you know, in a few years our campaign will be successful. It took the University of Vermont five years to successfully enact their ban. For private schools, it's a little bit easier because they, they don't have all these harsh government regulations like we do. Um, well, they have some, but 
eventually we do believe that it is a feasible option and, you know maybe it might take for maybe five six years but we believe that in the end you know our work will educate people and we can successfully get it done here at NIU. Thanks Sarah. Uh, yeah I got an environmental studies minor here at NIU and took a class with the water specialist here Melissa, Melissa Lanchuski, who had us read a couple books about water, about how municipalities are selling the rights of their water to these big multinational corporations. Aquafina is sold by PepsiCo, which happens to be the biggest food conglomerate in the world. Uh, I think it's wrong that we're doing business with the biggest food conglomerate in the world selling it right here in our vending machines. Uh, the only reason that it happened, that they changed it in Vermont, is because the students rose up and they said, we're not gonna take it. They provided the impetus for the university to change. The, the university is not gonna change unless we tell them that we're unhappy with the situation here. And that's what environmental activism is all about, that saying, we, we need to be the change that we that we seek. And the only way it's ever gonna happen is when people uh, do things like have petition signings, which we do a lot through the group. Uh, and then we try to gather up as many petitions as we can and try to take a meeting with the president of the university, which we never are able to do. So then they kick it down a little bit. We try to get a, a meeting with the vice president, which never happens. Then we go for the head of pro procurement, which we can't do. We can't even get into his office. But eventually they kick it down the line and we get to meet with somebody. And then hopefully that person is gonna hand it off. We do a lot of letters to the editor. Uh, so try maybe bi-weekly to get a letter to the editor in uh, to the school newspaper so people are reading about it. When they're signing petitions, they're, they're questioning why, if they're not in an environmental studies program, why, why, what's wrong with the water? What's wrong with buying bottled water? And, and then we have an opportunity to tell them that, you know, the water rights are being sold. Uh, this is the future. The future is that water rights are being sold down the line and eventually water will be privatized and we will be paying top dollar for, for clean water. And that's what we're trying to stop now is this municipality selling off their water rights and it's really hard thing in, in the economy that we're in right now because people can't see past the short-term goals of trying to get back on track with the economy and are willing to sell their future for for short-term goals. So uh, just, you know, to be an activist, you really have to, I don't know, perhaps raise a stink, as they say maybe, and, and, I, and I speak metaphorically that, that way, uh, that, like I said, I really love NIU here as a school, but there there is a lot of room for improvement. And unless we raise our voices to say that we're not happy with the way the situation is, then they're never going to change anything. So uh, that that is the reason that we're we're really going after this water thing. Plus, like I said, the University of Vermont has done it. The precedent has been set. They just banned water bottle sales in Grand, uh, I think, in the Grand National Park in Colorado. So it is starting to happen. It's, it's a little bit of a snowball effect. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure what the situation is in the Philippines with water, if it's, if it's a lot of bottled water or not. Uh, perhaps uh, I would really like to open up this panel discussion to, to get the, the, the students' uh, point of view in the audience as well. You want to share some thoughts? Is water privatized all over the Philippines? In some parts of the Philippines? Is Manila privatized? The water in Manila? Yeah, who owns it? Lopez. Lopez family? Okay. Who, who among 
we do have access to tap water 24 7 without problem uh, are there areas near where you live where there's problem with water yes okay so how do people survive fire truck would come in. Are there places where there's no fire truck? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, this is from the tank, yeah. from the fossil? Yeah. Okay. We have one mic here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So she's saying that, uh, they're saying that there's no water in some parts, including Davao. Uh, they have to rely on a fire truck, and, and some people can take a shower until such time that, uh, that there's delivery of water from the fire trucks or from the tap. Yes, please. Please use the mic. Despite that my city is called the city of waterfalls, where in fact the hydropower plant is located, um, generally our city has a lot of problems in terms of water. I mean, we can't drink from the tap water. We have a lot of business um, merchandising in terms of distilled water. So it is now. Excuse me, why can you not drink from the tap water? I think because it's, uh, generally there's no water coming out. Oh, from, there's no water. There's no water. And some other parts of the city where it has tap water, it's not really safe because I don't think that there is enough research funding and stuff that we can drink from the tap water. And as well as, it's commonly known that if we drink from the tap water, you know you can do a chemistry class experiment that's what we did when I was in high school and even when I was at the University of the Philippines our chemistry teacher would say go uh, get water from the tap you live in XYZ community and go to river XYZ so we bring water samples go to our school lab and then with distillation and all kinds of stuff and then we try to plant let's say soy uh, in one two three four five pots and water them with the same water and see how they grow uh, so there are many maybe that could be one way you can test the water with your chemistry professors in school and then that could be your contribution and write something about it if the water is really safe or not safe just some ideas that you can concretely do. Yes, please. Hello. I just would like to add something to what Phil said a while ago. Uh, in Davao City, I think, uh, as, as far as I know, that Davao City's water is one of the best and one of the safest water in the world. All right. But our problem now is the protection of the watershed in Davao City because some of the, the watershed areas there are being converted into agricultural areas and residential areas. So our concern is to really protect especially the borders of the watershed, which supplies uh, potable water to more than a million population in Davao City.